At the end of the year, we'll finish the historical questions and then we'll come back. The one, the one I'm taking today is the first one here. Uh, what is the church's teaching on the speak? This is from Justin Joseph. Has been, yeah. Uh, what is the church's teaching on speaking in tongues? How is it distinctive from the Protestant churches, especially Pentecostal churches who practice them often? Uh, a question was asked again uh, some time back, or again about this, by Rock Crasto, a parish of Christ the King, Burivali East. My question is, why can't we start praying in tongues in the church community before the Eucharist, before Mass? And so the church can train people to practice as it is a gift of the Holy Spirit as we receive at baptism and confirmation. And the early church was practicing it, especially St. Paul. Well, uh, to Rock and to Justin, let me speak a little bit. I thought this would need a little bit more of uh, explanation, a little bit, a bit, so it will be a little a longish answer to speaking in tongues. Uh, to the question of why don't we do it before church, it's not something we train people, it's, a, it's, it's something which happens. It, uh, in the early churches, there were many instances of people speaking in tongues. And uh, we find that in uh, Acts in particular, uh, Acts 2, or 4 to uh, 11, uh, you have, uh, after the Holy Spirit came on them, they went out and they, people were speaking. And in the Acts, you have that. Remember the time and all the people wondering, uh, what is this? Uh, they're all talking in, and, and we understand them in our own language. They were babbling in a language they did not know, but with the people understood. That was the Holy Spirit had filled them and they were speaking unconsciously as it were. We have that in 1 Corinthians 14, we have in Mark 16, 17. And now, uh, in 1 Corinthians 14 in particular, uh, you have uh, a lot of reference a little bit uh, where Paul is speaking of the gifts people have and he refers to uh, the gift of tongues also as a gift. I want to point out to you that he says that this is the, of all the gifts which are given, this is the least important in that sense. Because uh, he explains it is a gift which the person has himself, but is really not for the community. And, and if that's what, therefore, he doesn't, he doesn't give it much importance. He says, uh, if there's no one to interpret it, let that person who feels he has a gift of tongues keep silent. And now, uh, it is unintelligible to people, it's, it's a prayer addressed to God, which a person, uh, they, when the psychologist is trying to analyze, when they babble, uh, this was there in the very early church, it died out, as Justin says, it was there in some Protestant churches, especially the Pentecostals who had, uh, who experienced this gift, and uh, it began then, the renewal was in 1967, when we had it at uh, Pittsburgh, and they, they were meeting, People are meeting to pray together, university, everybody traces that to the beginning of the Catholic Pentecostal movement. Uh, then from there, uh, it went to Michigan, Ann Arbor, and then Notre, Notre Dame University in Indiana, these two, three places, and then spread all over the world. Uh, we had here, uh, soon after that, I think in 70 or 71 or 72, in, in, in Mumbai, began uh, this, this initially, uh, the, one of the first in India, perhaps the first in India, uh, with big uh, rally where those who were, had already had some influence from there came over. The first Catholic charismatic rally was held here in the Archdiocese of Mumbai. And now, uh, this is a prayer addressed to God. A person very often himself doesn't understand what he's saying. It's uh, an expression of the unconscious as it were. Uh, now, uh, it's people uh, People, spiritual writers said it is non-discursive prayer. So it's not a logical prayer, somebody saying. Uh, and uh, making a study, they said it's like a child who does not know yet how to speak, but is communicating something to the other. That's the way it is. It is uh, a voice of the subconscious crying out to God. Uh, in uh, As far as mystics are concerned, I will tell you, have generally the mystic, the great mystics in John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, have not given importance to this at all. But I want to respect, I want to say, we've got to respect it, those who feel that they have speaking in tongues. But uh, 
Uh, I want to read to you, might be useful for us, what Paul says. Uh, well, my, this is 1 Corinthians uh, 14, 26. My brothers and sisters, let us summarize. When you meet together, one will sing, another will teach, another will share some special revelation God has given, one will speak in tongues, another will interpret. But everything that is done must strengthen you. Uh, no more than two or three should speak in tongues. They must speak one at a time. Someone must interpret what they say. If no one is present who can interpret, they must be silent in our church meeting. Speak in tongues to God privately. So when you're in your room, speak to God. So then, then, then he speaks. So it's rather clear. I mean, I was surprised reading Paul. You're rather clear direction that St. Paul has given the church there. And I think the same uh, instructions we should follow. This tongues is not something artificial. Uh, I don't have the gift of tongues, so I don't fully understand what this is. But some people have. They feel impelled to say a few words, praising God, babbling. But we should have somebody to interpret it. Otherwise, uh, it's not very helpful. That's what this, that's, uh, Justin, I, I, that's the church's uh, teaching. Uh, there's been no formal document on this, but uh, uh, it's good if those who feel that they can speak. But as, mind you, that it should be orderly and it should be done by only, Paul says, only two or three and should be interpreted. Let us go.